with wonderful music. Yeah, we got James Brown, James Brown, Brown funk, brother background. Dino. We got exactly. Italian brother and brother Derek Allen doing the music. So you got nice, yeah. you got some nice funk underneath it. But it's really a conversation between you and Professor Michael Eric Dyson that I moderate about the N word. Why important to put that? I mean, I, I was asked to do it, and I did it because you asked me. But why important to put a track called the N word with that debate between the two of you? And Dyson takes one side of the use of the N word, you take another side of it. Why important to put a track like that on this record? I think because we want to speak to the realities, especially of young brothers and sisters who are wrestling with self hatred, self doubt self-violation, self-flagellation, and self-destruction. You can see it in chocolate cities across the board. And the white supremacy inside of black people leads us to demean ourselves and devalue ourselves. We're less beautiful, less intelligent, less moral. The niggerization of black people wait, was wait, precisely... Wait, wait. What, what was that? The niggerization of us. What do you mean by niggerization? The attempt to view ourselves as less than human and thereby become deferential to white supremacist authorities for 400 years, you see. So what, the, what, what, what Dice and I are talking about is how do we try to promote a renaissance of self-respect, a renaissance of self-love among black people, but especially young black people, especially young black people. So then Brother Dice and others say, well, nigga, N-I-G-G-A is really a term of endearment. It's really an expression of love. I say that's fine because it's all about the love now, brother. Because, see, once we begin to love each other and love others, you got something that is hard to stop. Because love is not some sentimental, wayward sentiment. It's a steadfast commitment to the well-being of others. You know, our Jewish brothers and sisters have this word, hesed, mm -hmm. which is a steadfast love. You know, do justly, love mercily, walk humbly with thy God, Micah 6, 8. When it says, love thy neighbor, Leviticus 19, 18, that Palestinian Jew named Jesus, who means the world to me, would pick up on. See, so this love talk of Martin King, the love talk of a love supreme of John Coltrane, the love talk of Toni Morrison's beloved, that's serious. That's why we go back to Curtis Mayfield. That's why we go back to Aretha, trying to keep alive this legacy to the younger generation. Because our younger generation, our brother, they're too unloved. Mm. They're not loved enough. Speaking of, to, that, to that point, though, uh, Maya Angelou, who oh, yes. has been here so many times, sat in this very sat same chair. Sat in this very same chair. Dr. Ma Dr. Like Maya Angelou that. says, though, that back to this, to this N-word and, and the love that our young people ought to be receiving, uh, and their, in her judgment, misuse of the word. Yeah. Um, Dr. Maya says, Dr. Angelou says, that if you pour poison in a vial, hmm. or if you pour poison in a piece of Baccarat crystal, hmm. no matter what it's in, it's still poison, and it will still kill you just as fast. So to your point about whether you yeah, say N-I-G-G-A yeah. or N-I-G-G-E-R, her point is that it's still poison, and that there really ought not to be a word about it. So I suspect she was happy earlier this summer when the NAACP buried, buried the symbolically word. the N-word. Yeah, but the problem is, you see, these kind of symbolic gestures that don't affect stuff on the ground mm -hmm. are misleading, too. Because mm -hmm. the NAACP needs a renaissance <laughs> in self-respect. Yeah in terms of how some of them treat each other. So it's not just the young folk using the word. I know a lot of Negroes who never use the word nigga mm -hmm. and still don't love themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's that action on the ground that's the key. Martin King, for me, could use the N-word all he want because he loved us enough to die for us, brother. Malcolm could have used it. Elijah could have used it. Elijah loved black people, even though he didn't love white brothers and sisters enough. And I'm a Christian, so I think we got to spill over in other communities, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that the love that is so crucial, and we got to make it concrete. I mean, when I think of your covenant movement, brother, and what you were able to do, your struggles with these debates that's taking place to make presidential candidates accountable and responsible to all of us as both American human beings, but especially the most vulnerable. That's love and service. It has to do with sacrifice. It has to do with persistence and perseverance. Most importantly, it has to do with courage. When you love somebody, you got courage. You got a mental and moral strength to persevere in the face of whatever danger, whatever difficulty, and whatever fear that you have. We need that kind of renaissance. But it can't be simply symbolic, and that's what young folk know. Mm. That's why when they see this uh, 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 memorial for the word and this eulogies preached and so forth, they want to see sermons. They don't want to hear them. Mm. You see what I mean? Mm. Where's your action? Ex examples are the go-kart of judgment. Bad judgment, bad examples, great judgment, great examples. Who are the examples? Jesus. Who are the examples? Amos. 
Mohammed, Martin, Gandhi, Mandela, my father, your mother, my mother, all of all colors now. Those are the great examples. Let's keep the focus on them and their action and behavior, not just the words that people are buzzing around here. Since you, since you went there. I mean, Bush never used the N-word. Look at his attitude toward Katrina. I got your point. <laughs> he might have just been niggerizing us openly. You see yeah. what I mean? So let me ask you right quick, since you went there. Um, it's in the news today, so it's, it's, it's a good question to ask. Um, it's been announced by PBS that four of the Republican candidates have told us, at the moment at least, that they're not going to be at our debate September 27th in Baltimore. We asked them to reconsider. We think it's a lost opportunity. Mr. Thompson, Mr. Giuliani, Mr. McCain, Mr. Romney, what do you make of those four Republicans deciding not to come to an opportunity to talk to Americans of color? Well, I just think it's a grave mistake. It's a bad judgment. You hope that, of course, it doesn't express what many believe, which is that it's a basic pattern in the Republican Party. They've been able to push black folk to the corner. They thought somehow they could appropriate enough slices of brown to go along with their predominantly white followership to win. I think the Republican Party is in such deep crisis that, in fact, it will lose because it can no longer mobilize enough brown. It can't reach out to black, and therefore they have very little to say. I applaud Brother Huckleby and the others who are willing to come, but the Republican Party is in deep crisis. We wonder, where is Condoleezza Rice at this moment? Where is Clarence Thomas at this moment? Where are the black Republicans who talk about the Republican Party being so fair and willing to embrace a variety of different people? Let's hear their voices, as it were. But most importantly, what I love about what you're doing, though, brother, is that we have got to take the higher moral ground. We've been saying for a long time, Republicans, for the most part, you're unconcerned and indifferent to poor people and working people and people of color. And indifference is the one thing that makes the very angels weep. Show us that we're, you are wrong. By not showing up, they're telling us we were right in the first place. But the, but the challenge is, is that whoever the Democrats produce is going to win. And ironically, that means that whoever convinces black people is going to win. That's why Brother Obama, who I support, I love my brother, he's a decent, brilliant brother, but he's got challenges. Hillary Clinton, Clinton's legacy, of course, ambiguous in many ways, like Brother Bill, and very critical of the welfare bill and a whole host of other things he did, that she's now slightly ahead of my dear Obama in the black community. He's got to be able to move forward and still bring the white brothers and sisters with him to win. But we're in a very uh, precarious moment here now, brother. He doesn't hold back in the classroom, he doesn't hold back on TV shows, and doesn't hold back on his CD, and we are all the better for it. The new CD is from Cornell West, Never Forget, A Journey of Revelations, on sale now. Dr. West, I honor to have you here, as always. Always a blessing, and brother, nearly five years of love and service to the public. I love you, well, brother, and respect you. you. Tell you, you that. You are too kind. I thank no, you. I'm telling That's you. our show for tonight. Catch me on weekends on PRI, Public Radio International. Access our radio podcast through our website at pbs.org. I'll see you back here next time on PBS. Until then, good night from Los Angeles. Thanks for watching, and as always, keep the faith. For more information on today's show, visit Tavis Smiley at pbs.org.